So uh, what I want to do is talk about tandem mass spectrometry in the context of proteomics and peptide dissociation, but realize that these same principles and techniques are really amenable to whatever molecule you're putting in your mass spec, but the, uh, the proteomic um, um, sort of example is, is really uh, a nice way to, to illustrate. So in case you're not um, familiar with proteomics, basically, it's the idea to use our mass spectrometer to study the proteins in a cellular system or a tissue or so on. And, you know, this is really a tremendous challenge that uh, mass spectrometry has played a big role in because there are, you know, while there are only about uh, 20,000 human um, uh, coding genes, there are uh, is a tremendously larger diversity of proteins in, in, a, in a cell because they can become modified or spliced in, in various ways. And so um, if, you, if you think about it, it's, a, it's a quite a challenge. So, and then I think just, to, I sometimes start lectures with, a, with this particular data slide that just to help us all get our head around what we're talking about. So, you know, I've, we've got moles on the left and mole, number of mole, uh, accordingly number of molecules on the right. So if you think about a grain of salt, it's about, you know, 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 molecules in there. It's a relatively large amount of material, uh, more than an animal. Um, if you think about traditional techniques for um, analyzing proteins and gels uh, or traditional sequencing techniques like Edmund sequencing, you need about a picomole of material to do that. It's about 10 to the 12 molecules. But imagine that you have a molecule or a protein that's only um, created at one copy per cell. If you had a billion cells, you'd still only have a billion copies of that molecule and you'd only have a couple of femtomoles from all those 10 to the nine cells. And you'd be well below the ability to see it by these traditional methods. Mass spectrometers um, can detect things at very low levels, so maybe a million, probably even better than that, depending on the protein or the peptide, but, but at least an atomal amount of material. And if we think about when we're doing manipulations on these, um, <clears throat> on these molecules, our ion traps, you know, we typically only store about 10,000 ions in there. So that's, you know, a very small amount of material relative to a protein that's only present at one copy per cell. So it can be very exquisitely sensitive and useful for studying proteins and biological systems. All right, so I want to stress uh, before we get into tandem and mass spec, it's really important to understand isotopes. And Professor McClucky introduced this concept earlier this morning, but just to uh, highlight it again, because this is really important for understanding how we look at and, and interpret mass spectra. Um, let's just review this concept. So um, carbon we have defined to have an exact, uh, exact mass of 12 Daltons, and that's for um, carbon-12. Now there are isotopes of carbon. So for example, carbon-14 has a mass of 14.0032. So, you know, everything has a slight mass defect uh, relative to um, carbon-12. It's either slightly positive or slightly negative, pardon me. Now, thinking about isotopes, <clears throat> um, if we're thinking about biological molecules like proteins, these are the common elements that you would have in a protein. And if we just look at their masses and their isotopes, so carbon has more than C12 or C13, but the most abundant ones are these two. And you can see now that 99% um, of all carbon is in carbon 12, about a little over a percent is in carbon 13, and then the other isotopes make up the very small remainder. So about one in every 100 carbons is one Dalton heavier than C12. So that's going to be important when we look at mass spectra. None of the other um, atom uh, or elements have, have a, an isotope that's quite as abundant. There is a, a little bit of N15 here um, that you got to worry about, but it's, it's mostly carbon. So when we think about doing mass spectrometry, um, we need to remember that. So now let's take a look at amino acids. So <clears throat> this is going to be important because when we start to talk about tandem mass spec and how we um, under, you know, determine what the sequence of a peptide is, we should always remember that it's just a made up of a linear polymer of these 20 amino acids. And um, you don't have to have memorized these to, to um, just look at this figure and you can tell that they have different um, structures, that they have different um, uh, 
they're different, they're different um, molecules. And therefore, they have <clears throat> different masses. So here's a table of amino acids and their accurate masses. So let's look at alanine right here. This is the um, composition of alanine, C3H5NO. And if you add that all up, the uh, monoisotopic mass, so that's using carbon-12 and, and all of, the, um, of, the, of those isotopes I just mentioned, uh, you would get 71.037 and a bunch of numbers. And so every one of these amino acids has their chemical composition and a monoisotopic mass. And the only ones that are identical are, of course, leucine and isoleucine, we're at 113, but everybody else is different. Okay, so you can calculate these exact masses very well for at the amino acid level. All right, so now just to review something that came up both in um, both earlier lectures, that is the charge, which we learned about ionization. So we're putting charges on these things. And also a thing, a, a figure of merit of the mass spectrometer called mass resolution. <clears throat> so here is a peptide that is obviously synthetic. We made this. CACAC is the sequence. So it's lysines and alanine only. This is the chemical composition of this particular amino acid. And if we put it in the mass spectrometer and we put one charge on it, charge typically comes when we're doing electrospray in the terms of we protonate these things. So we have a proton added and this is the peak we get. And if we look at this and zoom in, we can see I have three different spectra shown here. The top one was the lowest resolving power at 1000. And if I have a thousand resolving power, you can see that this is the peak for having all carbon 12 in this thing. And this is the peak for having one carbon 13 among all of those carbons. And you can see so it's one Dalton heavier. And this is the little bump that shows up if I have two atoms of C13 in my molecule. So in a population, you're going to have this distribution, and that's totally predictable based on the chemical formula and the known isotope distributions that occur naturally. Now, if I turn up the resolving power to 10,000, I much can much easier distinguish these peaks, right? And if I turn it up to 100,000, they get very narrow, and there's very good separation between them. So now we can determine the charge on something by looking at this. We know that this is a, the, the C13 isotope of this peak. The spacing between here and here then is about one M over Z units. And if I know that the mass is one, because I know that that's the C13 peak, then I know that charge must be one, right? So I can figure out that that must be the plus one peak for this thing. So that's how we can look at a spectrum. We can just look at the isotopes. We know the spacing, we can measure it, and then we can determine what is the charge state of the thing we're looking at. And then we can get the mass of the thing that we're looking at. So the mass of this thing would be 811.5 minus the proton, so 810.5. Okay. So um, uh, Professor McClucky covered very nicely um, orbit traps and FTICR, and you can get high resolution. And I just wanted to throw this in here to say that sometimes when you're trying to figure out these spectra, so here's a spectrum right here. It's very complicated looking from a distance. And when you zoom in, this is a, a peak right here. Look at this has four charges on it. And this big lump, I wouldn't know how many charges because I can't resolve the isotopes with the low resolving power, but if I turn up the resolving power, I can see now, here's the thing, and the, the difference is 0.25, and I know this is a one Dalton, so I can now know that this is a plus four. So you gotta get back to mass, and to get back to mass, you can use the isotopes and the spacing to determine charge state. And then the other thing I would just say here is that obviously if you're trying to understand these spectra, these are very highly charged things, so the isotopes are spaced very closely together. Um, higher resolution is useful because you really have a hard time interpreting this or this. You really need to separate those. Now for smaller peptides, this comes from a fairly large peptide. For smaller peptides, you don't really have to have this resolving power, but for big things, it's quite handy. All right, now 
the next point I wanted to explain, which is really the setup for how and why we do tandem mass spectrometry, is that in, in this case, and in many cases, particularly for protein sequencing, accurate mass measurement is just not enough to sequence a peptide, which is a small piece of a protein. So this is a piece of data not so useful, but it just shows us over the course of a whole week, with this mass spectrometer, we can accurately measure things to within one part per million. So like that's pretty good mass accuracy. So you would think, well, if I can measure mass that well, why do I even need to like do anything more than know the mass to figure out what the peptide is? Well, it turns out that peptides, because they're always made of the same building blocks, they tend to have to be placed in specific mass bins. And this is a paper from a while ago that explains this. But even if we, so these piles here are um, at this mass, 1000.4, there's like 2000 different peptide combinations you can have for a given peptide length. But over here at 1005, there's nothing, right? So they tend to be all in the same mass. So, and then even if you have 100 part per billion mass accuracy at a specific bin, you might have several hundred combinations and in the one next door, there's no possibilities because they're all made of the same building blocks. So it's really not that easy to know what are the amino acids present just by looking at the mass itself. So we have to do something more. And that's where tandem mass spectrometry comes in. So just to orient everybody, I'm going to be talking about um, this mass spectrometer, which if you caught the deconstruction of a mass spectrometer, um, a workshop this morning, this was what got deconstructed. And if you didn't catch it, you could you should watch the deconstruction. But basically, this device, um, the ions come in here, and then they go through this quadrupole, which um, we learned is uh, uh, can be used to filter out certain things, and then they can be um, manipulated in these ion traps back here, and this is the orbit trap right here. So we're going to be talking about how we can use a device like this to do tandem mass spec. So here's a cartoon that I think will help us all get on the same page. So now imagine I am doing an experiment. And in my experiment, I have a mixture of peptides coming into the mass spectrometer. And I basically let all of the things, and, and uh, let's say it's a liquid chromatography column placed at the front of this device. We've got the electrospray that we heard about. All of the ions coming out of the column will be entered into the mass spectrometer where they can be passed on and then they can be injected into, in this case, an orbit trap system. And in that orbit trap mass analyzer, we can get this spectrum right here. Now you're going to see peaks all across this mass range. I've labeled four of them with different color circles. So let's just imagine those are four distinct peptide molecules so they have their own sequences and they're each distinct and there's probably many more than those four you see all these other peaks let's think about these four so now if i want to figure out what is the sequence of these here's how you could do it we can basically use this quadrupole to filter out everything except for this little window of mass to charge around the target in this case it's the blue one so i'm only going to let the blue mass to charge get through the device and down to here, and all the others will be deflected and they won't make it, they will get stopped. Next, what I will do is I can make that blue packet of ions, this species, fall apart. We'll talk about how we do that uh, in detail here in a moment, but we're gonna make it fall apart, and then we're gonna measure the mass of all the pieces, and we're gonna generate what is called a tandem mass spectrum, and that's this thing right here. So just to recap, we have a population of peptides, different sequences. We have chosen to select this guy right here, and this one is going to be injected into the mass spectrometer whilst the others are blocked. And we can do that by selecting that mass to charge range. Everything that gets through will be smashed and broken into bits, and all of the bits will then be mass analyzed to produce the tandem mass spectrum you see here, okay? So that's the process. Now let's go ahead and think about the tandem mass spectrum. You might say, well, how the heck am I going to use these bits that I smashed the thing into to figure out what it was? Well, that's the cool part about tandem mass spectrometry. So just imagine that peptide I showed you in the beginning, the CACAC. We know that the first letter is lysine. 
So if I were to break that peptide such that the lysine on the N-terminal side was to break off but retain a charge, I would detect it at a mass 146. And I look in my mass spectrum and here is a, surely enough a peak at 146. Now, if I break a different population of those of those CACAC ions in a different spot, remember I'm going to put in like 10 or 30,000 of them, some will break here, but some might break right here. And if they break right here, I have the mass of the lysine 146 plus 71 Daltons makes 217. That's this peak. So if I just look at the distance between here and here, my mass spectrometer tells me it's 71, and I know 71 corresponds to the mass of alanine. So I can know now that the sequence must be lysine alanine. Those are the first two residues on the N-terminal side of the peptide. Now I just keep this process going and I say, oh, from here to here is also alanine, and from here to here is also alanine. And then I take a jump, 128, and that corresponds exactly to lysine, and I can now know that lysine is the next residue. Take another jump, I get an alanine. The next step is alanine, and again alanine, and then all the way to the total mass gets me back to the lysine on the C terminus. So by looking at the peaks along the back bone fragments of this peptide, I can deduce the actual sequence going forward from the end terminus. But there's also all these other peaks, see, all these other peaks that I didn't talk about yet. Well, it turns out those peaks are coming from the C-terminal side. So if I break here, the mass of lysine on the C-terminus is actually 131. The N-terminus gives you a mass of 146. So now I know that that's uh, confirming what I already found out, and I can read the sequence in reverse now with the ions labeled in blue. Those are called Zs. The Cs come from the N-term and the Zs come from the C-term. So now we don't use manual interpretation that often anymore to actually map our tandem mass spectra to, to sequence. You can do it, and in the beginning, this is how it was done. But now we have computer algorithms, which you'll learn about tomorrow, that can automate all of what you're seeing. But the, but the point is, this is how it works. And if, you're, if you don't make the peptide fall apart evenly across the backbone, of course, then it's much harder to sequence it because you don't have the pieces that allow you to make these steps. So that's um, the take home message of what that looks like. Now let's put it all together in the context of a proteomics experiment. So this is our LC chromatograph and these peaks are made up of peptides eluding out of the LC column that we're going to learn about in the next lecture. But now imagine as those things come into the mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer is taking these scans, we call them the MS1 scan, where it's surveying the mass of all the eluding peptides. And then the mass spectrometer seek, it targets all of these things one at a time for isolation and dissociation to make them fall apart and analysis to produce tandem mass spectra. So this process can be very quick. In this case, 22 tandem mass spectra were collected in just over one second of time. So at about you know, 20 times a second, we can collect these spectra and we can map them to sequence. So you can see all these different sequences come from each of these different spectra once we search them. Yes. Can I ask you a question? It might cause you to go back a little, but. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Mura Lideran is asking that uh, how do we really do we really need to consider uh, uh, ammonia and water in the, for sequencing pe uh, peptides, or just B and Y ions are sufficient, or I guess C and Z ions are sufficient? Uh, yes. Um, okay. So sometimes um, when you do a fragmentation event, you can lose. Uh, you, the peptide can fall apart to, to have a loss of, to produce a fragment, say this one minus the mass of water because water might go away as a neutral species or ammonia can do that. Sometimes those smaller species can be seen down here where I'm not showing you. Uh, so those things can happen and it really depends on the way you're making peptides fall apart and how, how rough I suppose you're doing it. Um, so what, when you calculate all these masses, um, typically we, uh, you know, that's a, we calculate B's and Y's, I'll get into those in a minute, or C's and Z's, 
and we don't worry as much about the neutral loss things that are being referred to, but but you can depending on how you do your search. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent question, and I'll get a little bit more into structures and, and how things fall apart here in a moment. Okay. Feel free to interrupt with another one if they come along. All right, so we, we have done this experiment now um, 20 times per second, but now we've got a whole hour and a half worth of analysis. So within you know an hour or two, we can collect tens of thousands or 100,000 of these tandem mass spectra. So you can really um, generate tons of data very quickly. All right, so now I want to um, just sort of do a brief review. So earlier this morning, you heard about how the mass analyzer can sort out masses and and make these measurements. You heard about how it's critical that we ionize our sample because we need that to be able to measure it. And now we're talking about how we make them fall apart so that we can get sequence. So now to dig into this, how do we make, I, I sort of just said we're going to smash it or we're going to break it all into bits, but I was being a little bit not, um, I wasn't being very detailed and very generic. So. There are three main ways that we can make um, an ion fall apart in a mass spectrometer. And so they 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 go from sort of, I would say, the, the most common on the left, which are collisions. So by far the most common way to make your peptide fall apart is to collide it with gas atoms or molecules. Um, and we call that collision activated dissociation. Uh, sometimes uh, it's called higher energy C-trap dissociation, but that's really the same thing. HCD, CAD, it's all the same. There's ion trap CAD, and I'm sorry, this is a misprint here. It should be CAD, where you can you can cause things to have collisions in an ion trap. That's a little bit different process, but more or less gives you the same result, and we can go into some details later. Another way to do it is with a re reactions with electrons. So we can allow our gas phase ions to capture electrons or to receive them from a donor as in electron transfer dissociation. And that can produce a very different type of fragmentation that has uh, some benefits. And then we can also bombard our ions with photons. And so we we call that photo dissociation and the, and the photons can be, you know, across any range of light from ultraviolet, which are higher energy to infrared, uh, which, which would basically do a slow vibrational excitation. So there's a range of ways to do this, and I'm going to try to go through each of these in this order, uh, depending on how our time goes. All right, so just to summarize, this, this slide is going to help us sort of um, put these into context. So collisions are very fast, they're efficient, and they're pretty simple to implement. So that's one of the reasons why they're the most popular. Collisions can be problematic for certain types of ions. Um, and some types of ions don't really fall apart that informatively with collisions, but, but by and large, this is a very good way to do it. Using electrons, as in ECD or ETD, uh, can be very good for peptides or proteins having modifications uh, that are very large, like uh, large proteins or whole proteins. Some downsides are that it's a slower technique. Um, it takes more time to do. It's less efficient, and it takes more work to implement. It's like you have to have more stuff on your mass spectrometer to do it. So it's not quite as convenient as doing collision activation. And then finally, photons, they can be very fast and very simple to implement. And you, you depending on the wavelength you use, you can get access to many different dissociation pathways. Depending on the wavelength, they can also be lower efficient. Uh, they can have less efficiency. And you can get a lot of different fragmentation pathways assessed, particularly with high energy stuff. So it can be a bit less predictable. So these are kind of the pros and cons, and this is a very high level view. Most mass spectrometers that you walk up to will all be able to do collision activation dissociation. So we're gonna talk about that one first, because that's probably the one that you'll encounter first. All right, so here's a short peptide and we can see um, we've got X, Y's, and Z's on the top, and we've got A, B's, and C's on the bottom. So the nomenclature is that any fragment that you make on a peptide that contains the end terminus of the peptide should be called an A, B, or C. A would be if you break the bond here, 
A B would be if you break the, the peptide bond, and a C would be if you break the NC alpha bond. Okay, so A, B, or C just describes which bond you broke, and the A, B, or C total means that that comes from the N terminus of the, of the peptide. Now, on the C terminal side, we use X, Y's, and Z's, and it's the same thing. The A, the other half of the A is the X, right? So this bond gets broken, this is an X. If you don't have the CO here, but you break it here, you get a Y. And if you cleave here, you get a Z. So if you make a C, you probably make the complementary Z and so on. If you're doing collisional activation, you are making Bs and Ys. So when you collisionally or vibrationally excite something, you tend to get cleavage of the amide linkage and you produce primarily B and Y type fragments, okay? If you're doing electron excitation or electron capture or transfer where you have a free radical driven fragmentation technique, you're looking at producing primarily Cs and Zs because this NC alpha bond is the bond that is broken. And uh, A's and X's can be uh, produced and accessed with higher energy techniques like UV photo dissociation or really high energy electron interactions, which are not that commonly used. So primarily you're making Bs and Ys, Cs and Zs, but if you're doing some more exotic stuff, you might be making As and Xs. Okay, let's talk I a little bit. For you, Josh, before you move on, um, based on the questions we're getting, I feel like we really need that manual interpretation <laughs> workshop. Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, the, there is one question uh, coming from anonymous. Uh, is the uh, is the peak? How how do you know if the peak is a C ion or a Z ion in the spectrum? Yes, that's a great question. You so so let's say um, I will just run back up to the spectrum here. How do you know what's a C and what's a Z? Well, the answer is you don't. And these things come to us, right? We collect them. Oops, sorry, we collect them like this. We just know the masses. We don't know what's what. So um, there are special rules and relationships that can that can help you figure these things out. And uh, in the in-person class, uh, summer school, we have, uh, last time we held it, we did a workshop where we spent an afternoon and everybody got these rules and we gave you a pen and paper and spectra and we figured them out. Some people got really frustrated and some people thought it was great. Um, the point is that uh, you can work these out and there are rules. So basically what you would try to do is you would try to figure out pairs. So I would say, okay, I've got this peak at 146 and I know it's a C ion. 146 plus 685 add up to the total mass, 829. This must be the complement of that. So then I can label this as probably a Z and then I work my way down and back. So the good news is you probably won't have to do this ever, but maybe if you get into some specialized stuff where you're trying to sequence things that there's no known genome or you can't do a database lookup, then you would have to do that. But I encourage you all to sort of look into these things because I think it's really useful to understand them, even if you're not really, you know, having to do it every day. It's like a puzzle. And if you're into puzzles, that can be a lot of fun. So that's a great question. Sorry, I skipped over it. Uh, that is the explanation. Um, I think we got the question. All right, let's think now about physically what is happening when we do collision activated dissociation. So here's an image, it's a cartoon, but I want you to, to just imagine that we have this collision cell. It's probably some cylindrical multiple device, and we just kind of draw it as a half cylinder here. And inside that cylinder is a reasonably high pressure of gas atoms. Let's just use argon. So let's say we pressurize this with argon. Now, what I will do is I will have the upstream ion optics over here set at a higher voltage such that the precursor ions are being accelerated and they're coming into here with a pretty good energy. So imagine my car is moving, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour. Hopefully we, we've, we've taken all the people out of it so nobody gets hurt here. And now we're going to, it's going to be slammed into these argon atoms. And when they have these collisions, what will happen is the argon uh, atom will impart this vibrational energy into the peptide. So the peptide bonds will become vibrating like this. 
and we hit we make it hit hard enough that those vibrations get to be so much that the weakest bonds will break and on a standard peptide those bonds will be the amide linkage the amide linkage the peptide bond when it's protonated will be weak and that will be where the the fragments are directed and so we will randomly ideally we will randomly break it across these backbone bonds and to make smaller fragments. Now, sometimes in this beam type collision activated dissociation, also called HCD, these fragments will come off with a good amount of energy too, and they will have collisions and our fragments will become fragments themselves. Like we can have multiple rounds. So a, a B ion, for example, might collide and knock off um, a neutral loss to become an A ion. Right, so you can get A ions in collision activated dissociation, but try, but they're probably produced by that mechanism where a B collides and then it knocks a little piece off and it becomes an A. Then these product ions will be moved along and mass analyzed elsewhere. So that's collision activated dissociation. I'm going to pause and make sure there's nothing coming in for questions. And we'll now take a look at a spectrum. So remember CAD, also HCD, same. This is a this is a thermo orbit trap name, but it's really the same as CAD. And this is a spectrum now of a real peptide. It's obviously not synthetic anymore. And you can see it had two charges and we get a big bunch of Y ions and we got a bunch of B ions. And uh, this is a little thing that shows us our mass measurement error. So they're all falling pretty nicely. Now you can change the collision energy. So remember I told you that um, we're gonna accelerate these into this chamber and you know, it's like we can accelerate, imagine this being a car, we'll go back to the car, the car can come in at 100 mile an hour, it can come in at 20 miles an hour. We can decide how fast it comes in. And that decision is important because you can see here, this is a number that like a percent energy 18. If I put it at 18, this is the thing I started with. I got some fragments, but not a lot. If I turn it up to say 30, I could totally obliterate the thing I started with and I'm making, look at, I'm making some A ions because I'm busting up the B ions. So you can see, you can, you can, you control how fast it comes in and how much energy it comes in with and how much you fragment. If you go too high, you just bust it up and you, you lose signal. So you don't want to go too high, but if you go too low, you, you don't make it all fall apart. So you really want to get it in that sweet spot. Now, fortunately, these modern mass spectrometers will allow you to calibrate the system and it'll auto tune and it'll calibrate. So you don't really have to think about this too much. But if you if you get spectra that don't that, that, that don't look right, you know, you can tinker with these collision energies and you can try to get a better result. OK. Let's talk about the next technique, which is electron capture. So. 25 years ago almost, um, this is um, uh, Fred McClafferty and this was uh, Neil Kelleher and Roman Zubarev were working in his group and they figured out sorry. that in, oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Sorry, uh, we have a few questions related to what you just finished talking about. Okay. Uh, so one question is, uh, and I think they're kind of related. So is there a way to reduce the secondary collisions? Mm -hmm. Right, so in beam type collision activation, uh, now I, I don't study this a lot, but basically um, the way you reduce these secondary collisions would be to reduce the energy coming in on this, the primary way to do it uh, would be to bring this in with less energy, but then that's going to, um, you know, that's going to push the thing back on, in, on this end of the spectrum. So it's just a balance and it's really about how much acceleration you bring it into that chamber. Um, of course, it depends on the pressure of the gas that you're colliding it with in that chamber and and um, and the size of the thing. But but once you get all that figured out, it's really about tuning that collision energy. Now, I entrap collisional activation, which I didn't really talk about, and I will I will now mention. And in I entrap since you brought it up. So in I entrap collision activation, I don't really have a good schematic here, but imagine in an I entrap. I basically a linear ion trap. I've got helium in the background, and what you do there is you you don't accelerate it this way, but you accelerate it to have oscillations in an orbit that's that's sort of speeding it up. So it has these oscillations, like my like my pointer is doing right now. So when you do that, you're now imparting 
lower energy collisions, but you're having like hundreds or thousands of these little energy collisions. So imagine in HCD, I'm putting in a bunch of energy in one collision, where if I do this ion trapping thing where I excite it in there, I'm having little teeny steps, but they all add up so that eventually you'll make the thing fall apart. And so this is ion trap CAD, and you can see here, I was able to get rid of all of this and make fragments, but I didn't overdo it because once the thing falls apart, those other things aren't being accelerated. So that's another way to do it, uh, ion trap collision activation. So I think that was a long-winded answer, sorry. Is there anything else, no. Kenya? Are we good? No, that's good, thank you. Okay, all right, let's go into electron capture. So this is, a. Uh, uh, you saw Professor McClucky talk about an ICR, a FTICR system. So ions are contained and confined largely by a magnetic field. And it turns out in this cell, you trap these multiply charged ions. But if you trap thermal electrons, they discovered that these electrons would get captured by the peptide cations and would actually cause them to fall apart in a different way. And so in electron transfer dissociation, we recapture the same chemistry, but we do it slightly differently by taking a multiply charged peptide cation and we react it with an anion that's smaller, typically singly charged, and an electron, if we pick the right anion, will jump onto the peptide cation and now that will cause a free radical dis driven dissociation, just like an electron capture dissociation, to cleave the NC alpha bond rather than the amide bond. And that can be done in ion trapping type instruments. And so now this is a spectrum where we took this particular sequence peptide and we reacted it with this anion. And we get um, all these fragments, C and Z fragments. So the efficiency is a bit lower because, you know, we, we well, I'll go into that in a moment. But the benefits here are that for certain peptides like this one, which has a, the P stands for phosphorylation, this serine is phosphorylated. If I collisionally activate that, the phosphoryl group tends to be the weakest bond and it pops off such that I don't get cleavage on the backbone any longer. So I get these tandem mass spectra that have one main fragment, the thing, the mass of the thing minus the phosphoric acid, and you don't get backbone fragmentation. So this can be very almost impossible to sequence. So with an ETD technique, that phosphoryl group is preserved and I direct my cleavage to the backbone. So you can see that, um, that that can work very nicely. So for larger peptides or peptides with modifications, this can be very useful. It is slower. Uh, so these reactions take some time whilst the collisions can be like done very fast. So, so that can, you don't get as many spectra per unit time, but if you have the right sample, you might get a, a much more informative spectrum. Just to show you how that sequence would work, it's a little bit more complicated because, you know, the steps one and two, I'm bringing in my precursor, I'm isolating my precursor, I'm mass analyzing the products, and collision activation, This all of these steps in red would just be collide precursor and fragment, but now I have to actually bring in an anion, I have to purify the anion, and then I have to actually conduct this reaction period. So this is why it takes a little bit longer. So that, um, all those steps need to be added. And then you have to worry about things like making sure that you get the, so in the collision activated thing, I told you, well, you want to optimize the energy of collision so you get the best possible spectrum. Well, in ETD, you want to optimize the kinetics of the reaction, which are largely driven by like the number of anions and the population of the size of the ions, the ion population. And so the more you have, the faster the reactions can be pushed. So that's good. And then the other thing that you have to worry about is because you're doing reactions of multiply charged, uh, positively charged precursors with negatively charged anions, um, what can happen is these, these fragments that you produce could also get reacted because they're in the same space. And so here you can see I'm decaying, I'm, I'm converting the precursor into these products, but at some point, I start to also consume the products. Now the products are consumed at a lower rate because the reaction rate goes as the charge squared. So a plus four, a plus two reacts four times faster than these plus ones, but nonetheless they can become consumed. So it's really a balancing act to really dial that in and get it just right. 
Um, I'm going to skip these because I want to get to. Um, OK, yeah, this is kind of fun. Then the other thing that's interesting with these. Um, these uh, electron transfer methods is that um, fragmentation efficiency can be can also um, depend on the charge state of the precursor. So this is really interesting. So I have the same peptide sequence here, but I'm going to dissociate it using ETD in the plus six version. So this has six charges in the plus five and also in the plus four version. So it's the same peptide, it just has different number of charges on it as coming as coming out of electrospray. And what you can notice is that the plus six fragmented very nicely. I've got fragments all along this space. But when I look at the plus four, I have much less fragmentation. And instead, what I see are these peaks that are the result of the thing getting an electron. So now I have one less charge, right? I, I take away one charge, but the mass stays the same, so it goes up to here. Now this thing gets another electron. I take away one more charge. And now the mass stays the same, so but the mass of charge goes up here, right? So that's called ET no D. We had electron transfer with no dissociation, and that's really not good because you need the fragments to do the sequencing. And you notice this happens much more prevalently when the charge state is lower or, or not as high, right? Four versus six. So we looked into that a lot, and we could see that as I increase the mass to charge, right? I'm increasing the mass to charge ratio, goes from 500 to 700 in this case. This is for a whole bunch of different peptides. As we increase this ratio, the, the likelihood that your ETD mass spectrum gives you a good outcome goes down. And that kind of fits with what I'm showing you here. And so what we discovered was that in the gas phase, if the charge density is low, like I don't have that many charges, the peptide, imagine it being like a strand of overcooked spaghetti. It can fold up on itself and it can have interactions. And so that when I dissociate it, those interactions hold the thing together. And so what we figured out, uh, one way to help solve that problem is to illuminate this thing with photons, IR photons, that will cause it to unfold but not dissociate. And then, I can do the electron transfer and the peptide falls apart. And so you could imagine if I could take a photograph, that's what it would look like. Um, we've illuminated it and now we're doing the dissociation. So we've set up a device that can do this so we can illuminate this trapping region with this uh, a laser here. And um, we will skip through that. But here you can see nicely that um, this peptide under normal circumstances would not dissociate very well, but if I just turn on the photon beam, I can get a beautiful fragmentation. I can open the thing up and make it fall apart. We call that activated ion ETD. Okay, so I've got about five minutes to go, and what I'd like to do is skip this little bit, go to the last topic, which is photo dissociation, and we're going to focus on UV, but um, but we can talk about all of them. So I really like this diagram because it kind of it kind of couples in the concepts we've been talking about. So this comes from uh, uh, from Jenny Broadbelt, and she specializes in UV photo uh, photo, uh, photo association. And so she's basically drawn these diagrams, basically saying, look, if we have this energy state diagram where here's my precursor, and I've got to put in some energy to get to these different fragments, fragment one, two, three, four, and so on, right? And so I need to dump in energy to get high enough so that this thing will fall apart. And if I do that with collisions, then I can, you know, maybe it takes four really good collisions to get to here, uh, to get enough energy to do this. If I do it with infrared photons, they're um, basically like slow cooking, so it takes lots of little uh, events, um, but eventually I can dump in enough energy but it's all going to get redistributed vibrationally, right? So maybe I can't access these really high levels because I'm putting in the energy in small buckets. And so that by the time I get enough, it's just going to go down the lowest, easiest to break pathway. It's not going to access these really hard to break path uh, fragments and get, get to those. And so um, if you put in a high energy photon, like a UV photon, you can achieve this really high energy levels of high, high levels of excitation with a single photon absorption event, and that's kind of what she's trying to show here. So and in an energy diagram, this, this could be one way to imagine this. 
So imagine that you basically have trapped precursors and you're just bombarding them with photons, whether they be UV or IR, you can achieve these goals. So um, 190 nanometers is a pretty sweet spot that a lot of folks doing UVPD like to use. And so one of the justifications of that is that the molar absorptivity of proteins in particular, so depending on, you know, what conformation they're in can be very high at this particular wavelength. So not only so not only is this a, a shorter wavelength, but its absorptivity is is quite good uh, for these types of analytes. So you can achieve um, this level of excitation. So this is a preferred wavelength. And now what you see here is that these high energy UV photons can, uh, can take something and um, kick it into a high energy level uh, that doesn't really allow for vibrational energy redistribution. That is what's happening in collisional activation, but instead um, gets you into this high energy state where you can now access A and X fragments and you can get all of these different kinds of fragments without allow, and so it can happen very fast. Um, it's not a slow cooking process. So it's just another way to think about it. So if I want to access this fragmentation channel, this is a, a more direct way to achieve that. And I think I have here a schematic of a, such a system where it's very similar to the one I showed you for AI ETD, except now um, down the length of this trapping region, region we have a, a UV laser. Uh, at 193 nanometers. So we can put out, um, you know, five nanosecond pulses and you can do one pulse for a trapped protein and you can access these types of, of fragmentation pathways. Here's some spectra um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So here's the sequence and you can see the collision activated result here, which is kind of very much similar to the ones I showed you. You get Bs and Ys mostly. And here's the same thing, but exposed to UV photo dissociation, where we're now getting our Ys and Bs. We're also getting uh, a few As. It looks like there's an X down here, uh, but it's just uh, uh, really um, obliterated and a little bit better and differently and better coverage slightly on this case. You can also do it pretty effectively in the negative mode. And I haven't had time to tell you about negative mode fragmentation because we don't do that terribly often, but there are some applications like um, nucleic acid sequencing that are becoming very important that really need negative dissoci negative mode dissociation techniques. And UVPD, here called NUVPD, uh, can do a nice job on, a, on the anion of this particular peptide. And you can see um, A's and X's and Y's in this case. Okay, well, that's, um, that's right about 50 minutes. That's where I wanted to end. Um, uh, Evgenia, what uh, is there any anything coming in that um, that we should talk about? Yeah, I saved a couple of questions. Uh, so one question is about is from David Kana, who's interested in knowing when you determine collision energy, is it something you just do by trial and error, or is there or you could gather something from the type of molecule or structure of the molecule, how much energy you will need to deposit to fragment it? Yeah, so it's really going to be. Um, you know, if, if I'm doing triptych peptides, right, um, we would calibrate the system using triptych peptides and we would um, determine, you know, for that type of peptide, which is, you know, they're all, you know, within the same range distribution and length, um, we would determine the optimal energy and we would set that. On some of these newer systems, um, you can do, they, they automatically do what's called a stepped collision energy. So imagine that I'm going to be injecting a beam of precursors for 10 milliseconds long. So like, you know, it's like a steady beam and it's coming in for a 10 millisecond duration. Well, a lot of them will carve that 10 milliseconds up into say three or four chunks. So let's say we carved it into four chunks. There would be four two and a half millisecond segments. And so maybe for the first segment, we would set the accelerating voltage to a low level and then for the next you know short period we'd set it to a higher level and so on so that over that period we would actually be collecting the composite of multiple different collision energies to maximize our chance so that's that's often done but if you're doing metabolites versus peptides you're going to probably have a slightly different um uh, range that you're tuning on, but you would tune ahead of time and then most of these systems would do what I just described as this stepped method.
Great, thank you. And another question that's somewhat related uh, is for you mentioned that ETD is uh, sometimes better uh, at preserving PTMs. Do you believe that this is a gen general feature of uh, ETD fragmentation, or are there certain groups of PTMs that are particularly good for analyses using ETD? Oh yeah, yeah. So. So basically, what makes um, ETD particularly uh, attractive for post-translational modification analysis is that um, when you introduce the free electron to the peptide chain, it tends to 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 be um, uh, directing cleavage to the NC alpha bond on the backbone. Well, there are some exceptions, but more or less, that's where the cleavage is directed. So if you have a phosphoryl group or a glycosyl group or you know, whatever you have hanging off some side chain, those tend not to be as reactive as the NC alpha bond in terms of like their ability to fall apart. So they tend not to fall off. Whereas if you vibrationally excite them, those modifications tend to be um, the easiest bonds to break if you're just kind of like stretching and vibrating the thing. So for most all PTMs, and I'm sure there's some exceptions, but I can't think of any offhand, ETD will not cleave them. Now, uh, someone brought up in the earlier session disulfide linkages, and it turns out that ETD and ECD preferentially will, will uh, cleave a disulfide bond over an NC alpha bond. So they actually are quite good at, 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 um, at, at breaking intra and intra disulfide linkages preferentially, but that's about the only modification that they seem to target that I can think of offhand here. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, this is a great response. I think I'll do one more question and then we'll switch on to the next speaker. And there are two questions. I'm going to combine them into one because they're pretty related. So one question is, when would you prefer to use UVPD? Uh, and another question that's related is, would you say that ETD and UVPD are better suited for middle and top-down applications than CID and HCD? So mm -hmm. kind of applications of UVPD and it's top-down and middle-down the application. Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, definitely a UVPD has been uh, shown to be quite promising for intact proteins and uh, I think there's even some work into native and, and protein complexes We'll probably hear some more about that uh, later on in the week when uh, Professor Waisaki speaks. But um, and then also I think uh, lipids. Uh, there's been some interesting work in the area of lipids with UVPD, and I think the negative uh, mode stuff is is pretty interesting too. So um, I agree with that. And then in terms of uh, like where's the sweet spot for ETD and UVPD? I think um, you know definitely triptych peptides tend to fall apart. The non-modified triptych peptides tend to behave very well by collision activation. And since it's simple and fast and efficient, it's almost always your best bet for a triptych peptide. Now, if you get some exotic modifications, then that's probably not the case anymore, or not necessarily the case. Um, but those triptych peptides are really well done by collision activation. Um, for glycosylation, um, uh, more exotic modifications, I definitely think ETD has shown um, a lot of promise there. So I think what you, what the 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 the, the way the question was written, that their suspicions are kind of in line with how how things are, and from my view. 